That is, I believe that's at Bo's, Bo's, Bo's place. place. Okay. I'm trying to think who has all those chips. It must be uh, Bo, because Bo ha I've heard Bo has a large collection. Uh, I think it's at Bo's from the opposite end of the table there. Anyway, that's, uh, that guy there is Anomalist uh, from Chicago. And uh, he did a lot of classes with us through the year. He was a good guy. He always had in mind uh, he was going to put together a team of lady shooters. And <laughs> he was going to call them the Dice Coteers, <laughs> which we thought was kind of funny. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll and tell you a like funny story throwing, about this It's like this he's one. throwing into the corner to me, or into the hook. Uh, he's trying to throw him straight down the wall. Anomalous had landing zone issues his whole I can, time. I would think so, because I can see those dice going into the turn. Yeah, and he released too high, and look at the position of his hand. Yeah. The dice are out of sync. I mean, there's a lot of things there. Uh, and this is the problem with freezing dice in eternity in a Photoshop from straight out like this. And this is why guys on the internet who advertise their dice classes with photos of their students shoot dice and advertise that they teach dice control classes shouldn't do that. Right. Uh, there's a guy right now who advertises his class as being advantage dice control classes, and he's always showing pictures of his students shooting from straight out. And their dice always look like this. Yeah. They're at angles, they're out of sync, they're walkie jawed, and I'm thinking, where's the dice control? You know. And, a lot of uh, ones I see the dice are still still in their hands sitting down on the table. They don't even show them in the air. Yeah. Well, yeah. And the ones that you see that look like they're perfectly glued together, hey, I got a tip for you, boys and girls. How do you get a picture of the dice that look like they're perfectly glued together? They're glued together. <laughs> hey. Wait a minute, I've probably got some around here somewhere. We use well, the train yeah, I mean, A lot of people practice with a dice barrel, but it can be a misleading photo for damn sure. Yes, it can. Yes, yes it, it can. can. So Anyway, so the story about uh, Anomalous, which is kind of a funny one. We were playing uh, with a group from the class down at uh, the Golden Nugget. No, I'm sorry, the Horseshoe, Binion's, downtown. And... Anomalous was straight out on one end, and I was straight out on the other end. And he was throwing the dice kind of like this, and they were coming down on my end of the table, hitting the table and bouncing over the edge, into the floor. And this happened repeatedly, over and over and over. Now, the dealers don't know that we're together as a group. So I'm doing my thing, which is I'm playing the distractor. Yeah. So I'm like, hey, you with a hat. Yeah, you, shooter. Do you know anything about physics 101? He's like, <laughs> huh? Uh, he's got the deer in the headlights look, okay? Because he has no idea where I'm going. I said, you're throwing those dice at a 45-degree angle. If you throw them within 12 inches of this wall, which is 12 inches high, they're going to hit at a 45-degree angle. They're going to bounce up at a 45 degree angle and they're going over the wall. You either got to throw those dice lower or you got to throw them closer to the wall. And he's like, <laughs> he's coaching at the table. Yeah, I mean, that's just what you can see. That's what's going on in his mind. But I'm just being the loud mouth guy at the end of the table, right? Yeah. And the dealers have no idea. So he throws again. They hit the same place. They go off the table. Hey, you in a hat. What the hell? I'm trying to help you here. Look, right here's your spot, and I'm pointing on the table. Throw the dice right here. And he throws them off the table again. And so I asked the dealer, hey, do you have a book of matches? And she says, sure. And she gets floor man to give me a book of matches. And I get a book of matches, and I tear a piece of paper off the corner of it, and I put it on the table about eight inches from the back wall and i say there there hit that spot right there and the dice will stay on the damn table and they leave it there nobody touches it <laughs> and he starts he starts hitting that spot on the table 
and he gets into a hand. And the hand goes on for 10 minutes, for 20 minutes, for 30 minutes, you know. And we get out there stretching about 35 minutes, and here comes the shift manager from downstairs, from upstairs. He's been watching this on the video, and suddenly he's got a hot table down there dumping money, and he's got to find out what's going on. Yeah. So he comes down, and he's watching the game, and they're watching it's going on and everything, and he, all of a sudden he says, well, what's that piece of paper on the table there? And the dealer turns and says, that's Bob's spot. That's where he has to <laughs> land the dice. And he goes berserk. Get that off the table. And he grabs it and throws it in the trash. And the next toss, Bob Sevens out. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, my goodness. That was a case of uh, heavy coaching at the table and getting it under the weather, under yeah. the radar. But sometimes you just got to cut well, out there and do it. I, I have enjoyed going through those pictures. I got I got some things I want to ask you about. You know, I mean, because Dar, you know Darth Nader mentioned something when I interviewed him. He about an eighteen hundred dollar. I think it was an eighteen hundred dollar six, and he wouldn't tell me the story. He said, "Get you to tell the story." Do you remember? <laughs> well. I guess I kind of surprised them all with this. It, uh, uh, it was actually an eight, uh, well, okay, not a an six. Eight. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, I play a strategy that I call a dominant number. It's a single number press. Uh, and I'll start out with 66 even or 66 inside. I think on this particular day, it was 66 even numbers. Yeah, you've always, you've always liked the even number best. Yeah. I understand. Yeah, that. yeah, because yeah, fours and tens, they, they'll treat you right if they start hitting. But Nate was a shooter. He was a stick right one. I was a stick left one. And Nate set a point. I don't recall what it was, but his first number he threw after the uh, point was established was the eight. And I had $18 on that eight, and my first move on that is to drop $3 and press it to 42. Right. And everybody else at the table is the same bet, you know, if they have it at all. Uh, some people wait until one row before they bet. Some people put out a first row come bet. This is a little hedge for the press line bet. And then they put out their, their other bets, whatever. I'm at 42 on it already. And I've got my other bets out there. Now, my rule on this is on the other bets, they've got to pay for themselves first. But I'm going to power press that one or press it every other hit on, on the, the first number that hit. So I'm getting a little, you know, up a unit action on these others. But the eight hits again, and it collects 50 for one. The next time it hits, I go to 90. It hits again, pays me 105. The next time it hits, I go to 180. It hits again, uh, pays me 210. So I'm racking money all along, and it hits again. And I drop $30 and go to 420. Everybody in the world that's ever watched any of my videos knows this is where I got my press from. <laughs> so I'm at 420 on this, and I'm thinking, oh, buddy, you know. Nate's hot on the eight today. I'm going to get that purple chip here, you know. And sure yeah. enough, he hits it for 500 for 10. I'm in Fat City now because I am not slowing down, right? No, no, no. Yeah, no, not so it hits, it hits for 500, and I don't hesitate. I go to 900. And now, I'm, you know, suits are drifting in. You know, I got 900 on that starting at $18. And the other stuff's getting pressed up, too. But $900 on that eight. And... uh Get a hit on that, pays a thousand fifty. I take the thousand, I take the fifty. Dealer hand in, the suits are crossing there and they're going, Yeah, it's a nice guy. He gave our boys a fifty dollar hand in. They like me, you know. Yeah. And uh next hit is a thousand. I So that's important for the viewers <laughs> to un I mean that I'm gonna back you up one step because you collected a thousand and fifty. Yep. 
you racked the thousand and you gave the dealers the 50 bucks. Yep, as a hand in. I cannot stress the importance of the things you do like that because. Yeah. And back when I, uh, it, it's when, so I collected one, when I collected 105 on the $90 one, gave when five. I collect 105, I take the black chip, I drop a dollar on top of the $5 chip and tell them to place the eight for themselves for $6. There you go. So there I get go. them some skin in the game at that point. Yeah. Well, I just collected a black chip. I don't need that red chip. I'll give them another dollar. Give them some skin in the game. Hey, you got a six dollar eight. Follow my press. You know, Perfect. do what I do. Because we've all I've been in been in some heated discussions with some guys recently on YouTube about pressing or betting for the dealers and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I appreciate what you do for the dealers. I know the dealers do too, and I'm in a hundred percent agreement. I love it. Well. Right. Cast your bread upon the waters, <laughs> and it shall return to you in many days, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the old scripture verse, and we all know that, and and I believe it does. Yeah. You know, I believe, honestly, that every dollar I've ever tipped in a casino has come back to me in better service, in decisions that went in my direction, questionable calls at some point down the line, uh, where I've had an issue with something, where I've had to make a phone call the next day and say, hey, here's what happened on table 10 at 8.15 last night. Joe was sitting on box. Jimmy John was the dealer, and I had a $25 horn bed up there, and you're Dick tapped out without paying me, and the guy that came in didn't pay me, and the box man said I got paid. I wanted the film reviewed, and they didn't do it. I'd like somebody to look at the film today, and if I'm wrong, I'll come in and apologize. But if I'm right, I like my money yeah. and maybe a comp for a steak dinner. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. Absolutely. And, and invariably, I'll get a phone call within a day or two from, from the shift manager, the casino manager, apologizing, telling me I'm right. When you get to the casino next time, have them call me down. Yeah. I'll have your money and a comp for a steak dinner. And if you guys want to stay here, we'll comp you for three nights and blah, 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 you know, and, and hope you understand that's not the way we run our casino there. These guys are going to be reprimanded and they're going to be watching the video of everything that happened yeah you know all right so i i know i interrupted your story no that's all right no but so, I, I, that's so important for people to understand yeah why we bet and why we why we want it's not just a hand in all the time but we also place bets for them and and we do both and that's it's yeah. so important so go on with your story yeah so so nate's standing down there at the other end of the table and he looks up on all these suits and and you know, and I'm at I'm at eighteen hundred dollars. Well, he hasn't seen the suits at this point. I'm at eighteen hundred dollars, and now along the line in this process, two things have happened. One, a drink girl has walked up to Nate just when he's about to toss, and did the little finger thing down his spine and asked him if he wanted a drink. <laughs> at which point I said, "Turn me off, please." They turned my bets off, and this was back about when I had 900 on it, you know. And uh, he powered through it and threw, a, threw an eight. Yeah. And another time, back up there when we were at 1,800, he threw the dice off the table, and I turned them off. And he threw a hard eight. <laughs> oh no. I found out later in talking to Nate that he had seen something he didn't like on the table when he got the dice back. There was some late activity down there or something going on and it kind of jacked with his chi or whatever and he just picked the dice up and threw them off the table so he could have time to get his 
mental crap back together and get centered and take control of the game again. He does right. that kind of stuff. It's like, right. it's my game. I'll run it under my terms. And my terms yeah. are, I'm going to throw the dice off the table and whatever. So he did that, got recentered, and came back and threw the heart. So it was two eight. I missed. Had I been turned on for those, I would have been on for 1,800, gotten a hit, dropped 300, pressed to 4,200, yep. gotten a hit, they gotten paid 5,000 or a hundred for a hundred and the next hit out of press to well 5,000 table max but they'd probably let me go to 6,000 I think I'm to 6,000 but then I lost yeah. on the next one after that but what happened was I got uh, to 1,800 and got paid 2,300 and that's when I, I got 1,800 pressed it Got paid twenty one hundred. Yeah, yeah. Got paid twenty one hundred. And like, I want that bet. Yeah, and <laughs> was standing there with three hundred in my hand, waiting for the next hit. When he seven out. Yeah. Now, when they paid me the twenty one hundred, that's when Nate discovered I had a big bet out there. Yeah, yeah. Because they paid me all in black. Wow. Okay. And uh, they, everybody's going. Ooh, at the table, you know, when that happened. And, and the dealer starts cutting out, you know, a full stack of black chips, you know, 2,000 black chips, and one more, you know, and right. pushes them over to me. And he's like, what the hell has he got down there? You know, and Nate's like, I've got $180 on the eight. And, <laughs> that would be and, Nate. <laughs> and this guy's got, he's got 90 on it. And, this guy's got 300 and and there's Howard down there with 18 on it. <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah, I know. I know. And, uh, and look at that. We've got, he's got $1,800 on it. And dude, you gotta, you gotta bet it when you can. Yeah. You know? I agree a hundred percent. Now that's not the first time that's happened to me. That happened to me at Caesar's palace one morning. And I've told this story. I was on the way to class. Better a class Saturday morning, and I was walking out of Caesar's Palace, and there was, strangely, a $15 table right there by the door as I'm walking out. Right. Never a $15 table at Caesar's. So I had to stop and play it. And I decided to play One Hit Can't Miss. Now, for those of you that don't know, One Hit Can't Miss is a strategy where you play essentially equal size bets on the don't pass and the six and eight. So I played, in this case, a, I think I played a $24, $25 don't pass bet, and I played 24 each on the six and eight. Yep. And the player set the six as the point and then proceeded to start tossing eights. So I took the first hit for $24 on the, on the eight, Lock that up. I cannot lose at this point because I've got right. a $28 win. So I've got a guarantee of $4. The next hit, I pressed to 42 and took, I think it's $11 change at that point. So anyway, I've got like a $15 guarantee at that point. Next hit, I take 50 for one. Boom. Now we're right back into the rotation. Next hit, go to 90. Next, collect 105. Next, go to 180. Next, collect 210. Yeah. Next, drop 30, go to 420. Next, collect 500. You know, and I've run it all the way up to 1,800. Collect 2,100. And when this thing is all said and done with, on this eight, this guy's throwing, I think it's 14 eights. I've made wow. $4,000 on the eight. And then he sevens out, and I win my $25 don't pass bet on the six because <laughs> he bet the six is the point. But I won, it's like $4,400 I won on that hand. And it happened in literally 15 minutes. I mean, it was just boom, 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 boom. Me and him at the table. I didn't shoot, I didn't hang around. It was like boom, color coming in, get me the hell out of here. So, right. 
those kind of hands happen in a heartbeat and you have to take advantage of them when they happen you know you, I, I, people disagree with me but i i preach it all the time especially on my channel is bet the numbers that are hitting and let and if and then take the other shit off the table yeah yeah it's i call it uh, it's like evicting a bad renter you know yeah. I mean, if I've got a nine that's laid there for 15 tosses and hasn't paid its rent, I'm sorry, the nine is supposed to roll once every nine rolls. If it hasn't rolled in 10 rolls, it's uh, it's not paid its rent. It's past due. So uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Nine. You're you're not paying your rent. You're going All home. Right. So I, I, I talked to Doza the other day, and I asked him about about that hard eight story. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember where you thought it was, but he swears it was at Main Street Station because he only yeah it was Main Street okay. yeah okay all right and he said y'all got he got walked out of the casino after that toss but I want to hear about I want to hear about this again from you because you're the main instigator in the story. <laughs> well, we had a class that weekend and a group of us were playing. Uh, this thing started down at the Four Queens, and, and we'd had a very good session down there. Uh, so good that the female dealer on the table asked for an early out and left the casino and followed us from casino to casino and played with us the rest of the afternoon. And we'd been down to the plaza where a bunch of us got new players' cards, including me. And they had a, a little gift they were giving away to new players' card members. And I think it was a closet light or something like that. And so a little in a box, had a battery in it, just stick it to the wall in your closet, you push it, and the light comes on, all that kind yep. of stuff. So I was packing a backpack with me that day, and I just added it to the backpack, and we kept walking around playing a session here, playing a session there, and we ended up at Main Street Station. Table on the right, if you were coming down the uh, stairway from, uh, from the – uh, California club and uh, all lined up there in a row playing having a good time and uh, we had uh, I think it was Irish setter at stick right one I was stick right no, yeah I was stick left one and Dosa was stick left two and Irish had had a good hand 45 50 minutes and I'd had one about the same so we were we were pretty much crushing that table. Yeah. And then it went to Dosa. And he was doing great, too. And the point was eight. And his hand just stretched on and on and on and on and on and on. And they had, I think, 10 times odds, maybe 20 times odds down there at that time. Uh, but it was one of the highest odds casinos in, in Vegas. And and I had pretty big odds bet back there. And I wanted him to hit the damn point, you know. Mm. So... I finally got to the point of let's let's get the point, Dave. Come on, you know. So I I say, what can I do to inspire this guy to get the point? I know I'll offer an additional incentive. So I opened up my bag and pulled out my closet light. That's the only thing I had in there I was willing to offer. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I announced to the table. For the next person who throws a hard eight at this table, I have a lovely prize for you. This beautiful, you know, and I read the name of it, electronic closet light, you know, and I start reading all the features and benefits of it off the label. And show it around everyone. All you have to do is throw a hard eight and make a point right here, right now. How about you, sir? Would you like to throw a hard eight right now? And so Dave picks up the dice and throws a hard eight, and I give him the damn closet light. Uh, and make a bunch of money in the process. But yeah, we were uh, we were pretty high and feeling good and showing off that day, and uh, probably got a little attention we shouldn't have, but those were fun times. Well, he, he, he told me that, that he got quote unquote escorted out. Now, he said he only threw that one hand, but he decided i don't know whether he he decided or what but he said he was kind of encouraged yeah. to go out the front door well, they were getting a little a little put out with us at that point yeah so. yeah well you've 
you've influenced so many people. You've influenced me, and I've always been grateful to you for the influence that you've done done to me. And, you know, we were playing. We played, we played many times together, but I have some memories. And one was the first time I played with you, which was at the Flamingo, and I the first time I'd met you. And I, I think you were at Stick Left One. And it was, it was before a meetup or anything like that, but I had introduced myself to you as, you know, hey, I'm here for your class because I knew who you were, easy, easily to recognize. And I got down there on the right side in the, tur- in the hook, which was not, not my normal position. And I, I was so nervous throwing I mean, I really was. I was nervous as, as, as a cat in a room full of rocking chairs. And, you know, uh, I had a good hand. I think I hit at least one side and almost hit the all. And I knew that the set I was using threw a lot of horn numbers. And, and you kept turning your bets off and on and off and on. You'd, you would go through this acumen of, okay, he's starting to throw horns, and so uh, yeah, I'm going to get off. I didn't, you know, I didn't care because I knew that was kind of, I was playing the field. I knew that was kind of part of my play at that time. And I remember you saying afterwards, I hope it didn't bother you. I was turning my bets off and on, and I was like, I didn't even realize you were doing it, you know. Uh, but we got on a table one time, and this was right after COVID, and we were at the Circa. I don't know if you remember this or not. But we were at the Circa was like brand new, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were upstairs. The b- tables were long trampolines. And none of us were having a lot of luck. I mean, we were going around the table. And Banker Dude was next to me because you always, you know, you, you always were good at assigning people positions and how to block for the other shooters and all this, and we were able to get on this long table, and we took the table over. And I'm in the hook down there, banker dude straight out, and there's none of us catching any kind of long hand. I think we're all having a, a long, slow bleed, you know, all the way around. And yeah. We're probably a third time around. I remember around. it well. <laughs> you remember that, right? Yeah. So correct me if when I make mistakes in this story, but, I remember one time, in fact, one time I told, don't tell heavy, but I'm going to try the all seven set because <laughs> that's just got to change. I think I heard that, that actually. That didn't work. It didn't work. I promise you it didn't work, but I have a set to this day that I call my circus set. I got a June jam set. I've got a circus set. You know, I named my sets a little bit, but I got in a groove down there and I was pounding tens. Mm-hmm. Well, we all had on masks. Everybody, I mean, the sticks, all masks. And all, I didn't know I was throwing hard tens. You knew I was throwing hard tens because you're down there on the end where the dice are landed. All I knew was I was hearing 10 and I was getting paid on my 10, you know, and I'm up to $1,000. And hell, I think you were up to 100 or more on the hard 10 by the time, you know, I mean, I was pounding tens and hard tens, I guess. Yeah. You know, so, but the thing is, I guess where I'm going with this story is not to brag on me, but it's to brag on you. You have, and everybody that I've interviewed that's played with you and knows you, talks about your ability to read the table, to read the shooter, and having the awareness to make the proper bets on that shooter at that given hand. Now, I know sometimes we don't do it. You know, we have those Tuma moments, as we call it. But, but you're, one, you're, you're the best, in my opinion. Of, I appreciate that. Of, of table awareness and how to make those bets and even turn them off, like you were talking about with Nate a while ago. Um, Talk a little bit about how you figure that out and what you look for. <laughs> yeah, a lot of it's just pure intuition uh, or 
you get a feeling or that little voice inside you tells you that or whatever. Uh, sometimes it's just what the table's giving you and you just, you just see it. Yeah. But I, you, I, you, you picked up on a toss one time and I'm on the table too, where Darth Nader was throwing and we were at the IP down in Biloxi yeah, yeah. and he got on, and, I think it was a hard six. Yeah. And, and well, he threw a hard four first. Yeah. And because I play with Nate a lot, now this makes a difference if you play with someone a lot. Yeah, yeah. I know that his normal sets that he uses don't typically kick off hard ways. Now, he told me later that the set that he uses, that he was using that night, does kick off hard ways. But I didn't know that. You know, I'm yeah. just going by experience, and I know that my years of playing with him, I've never seen him use a set that kicks off a lot of hard ways. So he threw a hard four and I'm like, huh. he doesn't throw a lot of hard ways. And just intuitively last session of the weekend. Yeah. What the hell throw five bucks each on the hard ways and let's see what happens. And he threw a hard six, the very next number. Now that was really interesting. Now, I could have parlayed the whole five bucks, but I didn't. Instead, I pressed it up to a quarter and took back the rest of it, which yeah, paid for the others. So now play. all my bets are paid for. Yeah, you cut and I got a play. free twenty. I got a free twenty-five dollar bet out there, and two bets, two tosses later, he tosses another hard six. Well, now I've got two twenty-five. Well, this is sweet. So what do I do? I could have parlayed the whole thing, but no. I went to a hundred on it, took back the rest of it. I pressed 75 onto that, not 225, do the math. Anyway, so I've got a couple of hundred in the rack. Off of that, a couple of tosses later, another hard six. Pays me $900. And at that point, the table cheers and everybody's like, what the hell's going on? And they see the nine black chips sliding over toward me. And Damn, every has got a black chip on the hard chip. How'd that happen? You know, and it's just a matter of, well, he doesn't normally throw hard ways. Then I got paid on a hard four because he threw his second hard four also. So, uh, you know, that was just a matter of somebody that I play with that doesn't normally throw it. Right. Now, when I see hard ways start to show up in the hand, I'll, I'll bet them. I'll bet a buck each on the hard ways and see if they continue to show up. If you want to talk specifically about hard bucks. And if they continue to show up, I'll continue to bet them. And I'll go from a dollar to five to 10 to, to 25 to a hundred, you know, pretty rapidly on them. And if, if I get to the point where I've got, $5 each on of them, and one of them gets knocked down, I'll throw, instead of throwing a $5 chip out there to replace the one for $5 that got knocked down, I'll put $2 on the one that got knocked down and press the other three a dollar each. So I'm continually pressing the ones that stay up, yeah, but only replacing the ones that got knocked down for $2. So I'm throwing $5 out there pressing three numbers and replacing one. And the next thing you know, of those three numbers that you're pressing, one of them is going to wind up being 18, 19, 20 bucks on it. And boom, you're going to throw a hard 10. And that's the one that's got 20 bucks on it. And you're going to get paid 140 bucks on it. Hey, that was pretty sweet. You just, you never missed that little five bucks you were throwing out there. And all of a sudden you're getting paid 140 on it. Now you take the hundred and lock it up, take the 40, and press everything $10 each. Now you get another hit. Hard six rolls. Hey, now you get another 90 plus whatever was out there on it before. Suddenly green chips are flowing. Yeah, a lot of money can pile up on that real quickly. I, I, uh, I have made more money this year on hard way bets. And I had stopped betting them because, you know, it's a high house edge bet. 
and I had yeah. I had stopped. I used to bet them a long time ago, and probably yeah. was throwing money away. But now, this year, just just this year in 2023, starting January 1st, I've been aware of my. T- I only do it on myself primarily. I don't. I, I, I'm a lone wolf most of the time out there on the table. So, but. There have been a lot of hands where I see the first one and I'll go 25 on every hard way. And that's strong. I mean, that's probably yeah. stupid. I, I mean, I admit that's probably stupid. But I have made so much money this year, more money than, than I've ever made probably on hard ways this year. Because yeah. every time one hits, and I don't even care if the first hit's a 4 and 10, I will press every one of them a quarter. Mm-hmm. And just keep, and if if one gets knocked off, I may leave it off until the next one hits. If the next one hits, I'll put a quarter. Let's just say the hard eight fell. Yep. And I hit a hard six. Okay. Well, I'll I'll drop. I'll, I'll press everything one quarter. So there's only a quarter sitting on the hard eight, but you know I might have seventy five on the hard four and hard ten. And you know, I get in those. You get in those short windows of time where all of a sudden the same toss is happening over and over and over, oh, yeah. you know, and I cannot emphasize enough people trying to take advantage of that because that's a way to really make a big pop at the table. And it doesn't have to be a long hand. You know, it can be an upper teens hand, which is a long hand, but I mean, it's not, you know, I'm not a monster role. Or and anything. you can, you can kill a guy's hand with big pop. Yeah. So, For example, my last uh, last hand in Vegas this last trip, forty one number roll. Yeah. I'm throwing I'm throwing into a minefield. Okay. I'm throwing right down the pass line. This table's packed, and there are four old codgers. I got I got a right to call them that because I am one. Four old codgers play it, and they're just their bets are just they're that far apart, you yeah. know, yeah. and they're all stacked up with odds. So I'm throwing right into the minefield there. And I've been doing it for, you know, 45 minutes. I mean, I'm 41 numbers into a roll. I'm, I'm killing it. Dice are laying in right there, just beautifully every toss. And I've got big money coming back in on hard eights and hard sixes. I've been nailing hard eights over and over. And this old bastard on the end, God bless his soul, tosses out a $750 hard four, (laughs) right? (laughs) Who knows why? So what do you think my next roll was? I didn't change shit, right? Same toss I've tossed the last 40 rolls. Roll number 41, hard four. <laughs> These guys go batshit crazy. <sighs> you know, Ringing up all this 700 and seven, what, well, $5,000, you know, they're raking in down there. And so I'm there wait, watching the celebration, thinking, yeah. just made you $5,000 down there, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. They like that. <clears throat> Hard four on demand there. Don't get that service often. I didn't say shit, but I'm thinking all this stuff. Yeah. And uh and that was it. They racked all the chips and and I just kind of gritted my teeth and thought about bouncing the eye dice between the guy's eyes, but I didn't. And uh picked the dice up and seven out the next toss. Right. On a chip dink, fair enough, on a chip dink, on one of his chips. But, uh, and, and, uh, Nate said later, he said, I could see it in your eyes. <laughs> you know, he said, I could see that look in your eyes when you threw that hard four. It's over, you know, because yeah. that got in your head. And it did, you know, because yeah. this guy bet that hard four totally out of sequence for 750 bucks. And then I hit the damn thing. And it broke my concentration, my rhythm, uh, 
jacked with the crap between my ears and uh all i could think about was some bitch could at least throw me a damn red chip you know i mean <laughs> so yeah, anyway I had, same, uh, I had the same kind of thing not too long in biloxi i don't know it was earlier this spring and, and I didn't realize the guy even had to bet out there until they paid him. Yeah, he, had, yeah. he had a $200. You know, I'm sitting there. I think I had 25 or $50 on the hard ways because I was doing that little little press cycle on those hard ways. And he had a $200 hard four. Yeah. I didn't know it till the till the stick said, pay him $1,400. You know, and I'm like, holy shit. You know, what's he doing? Yep. But – you know, I didn't care. I mean, I, I, I just, I had, I had my, I had my money on it and I yeah, was happy. Yeah. But, uh, but the power of the hard ways comes home when you're, uh, and it, it struck me on, on, uh, this last craft cruise that my daughter Felicia went with on me when she had the, the 54 number hand, uh, yeah. with all the, all the tens on it. And, and I had like $500 on the 10 at one point and, my buddy next to me only had 125, and I've been been kind of riding him about, hey, off the slow to press there, you know, and and yet he had uh, about 200 on the hard ten, and and she threw a hard ten, and so I'm at 500 getting my thousand dollar payment, and he's with 200 getting paid uh, on a 200 dollar hard ten, and uh, I'm like, oh yeah, okay. Bet, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. So you've got a couple of other things that I always find it intriguing about how you bet. Let's just say, for example, you you come out with your even number, your even number play. Doesn't matter what yeah. the denomination is, but you're on even numbers. And you've kind of got some mental rules. Even if you're inside, you've got these mental rules about a number showing up before it's supposed to on a row. Like the four shows up really early or the five or the nine shows up within two, the first two rolls of a hand, that kind of thing. Would you, do you mind kind of walking me through that real quick? Uh, wow. You've hit me with something I don't recall off the top of my head. If the four well, and 10 you, show up you've first, got the math, you've got the math. Yeah, I do some, I, I have some, some math rules about, about when to bet a number. Okay, that's what I'm like, talking about. And they're and they're based strictly on odds. Like this, there's six ways to roll seven, right? Yeah. There's there's three ways to roll four, and there's three ways to roll ten. So there's six ways to roll the four and ten. So you should always bet the four and the ten as a pair. You always bet them both. You don't bet just one. Right. Because if you hit one, it pays for both, with the exception of the VIG, which we don't worry about. Yeah. yeah. So if you're a roll tracker, one well, of these guys that sits down and writes down rolls in a little chart, or tracks them with chips in the rail, or has a sharp mind and can keep track of it in his mind, and some of us can, you know if two fours have rolled in the last six rolls, or if two tens have rolled in the last six rolls, or if one four and one ten have rolled in the last six rolls. If they've rolled more frequently than that, you by God better be betting the four and ten. That's because, what I'm talking about. Yep. Yeah, they're they're sequencing. It's they're coming more frequently than they should mathematically. Right. The closer they come together, the better. So if you say Four, eight, ten. Okay, the fours and tens are sequencing. Let's be on them. If you see four, six, eight, nine, five, six, ten, they're not. They're far right. apart. You want fours and tens to come close together. You want two fours close together, two tens close together, whatever. Five and nine, four percent house edge. Hard it's to not, overcome. And, it's, and people don't understand that, that the five and nines is uh, the highest house edge on the boxes that's right four percent house edge highest edge in the box numbers and even so i will say even though it's a high house edge they only take the house edge out when you win the bet right there is no house edge on a losing bet 
So <laughs> I joke about all that all the yeah, time. But right. if you lose that bet, you just lost the damn bet. There was no house edge. <laughs> they only take the house edge out when you win the bet. And if you win the bet, do you really give a rat's ass? Well, right. yeah, if they take 50%. But if they take 4%, yeah, I mean, you place $35 on the five or nine, they pay you 50 for one. That ain't a bad deal, is it? And if you're in Mississippi, pays you even better. Yes, sir. You know? 52. So, uh, <laughs> it's not that bad of a bet. The thing about the five and nine is that house edge is so big, you cannot bet both those numbers as a pair. You have to bet them individually based on how frequently they're rolling. Mathematically, a five or a nine should roll once every nine rolls. So you want to be rolling more frequently than that. So again, you're tracking for compression of numbers between the fives or compression of numbers between the nines. Right. Fewer numbers between those numbers, the better. So nine, six, eight, nine. Ooh, that's a good compression. I like that. Let's bet the nine. Nine, six, nine. Oh, yeah, all day long. Two nines in a row. Get my ass on it. I want to be betting the third one. You know. Yeah. Uh, same with the five. You know, six yeah. and eight, so lowest do you house treat age. The in the five bill? and nines as sister numbers and bet them both like you did the four and ten. Uh, if you're betting sixty six inside and that's your strategy, or one ten inside, or you know whatever, and that's your strategy. I mean, you can bet that, sure. Okay. But do I you, would. Uh, do you have if, a favorite? Uh, I would also be tracking. I'd also be tracking to see if they're paying the rent. Is my old saying, you know, yep. I mean, hey, if we go eight or nine rolls and die, that bet hasn't paid its rent, evict that mother and put that money to work on one of these other bets that's paying its rent. Yeah. Yeah, if you, you got two a... hits on the eight and no hits on the nine, take that $35 off the nine, add a dollar to it, and put it on the eight, power yeah. press that SOB up, you know. Yeah. I, I, make I more agree. money. Do you have a favorite regression? strategy a or, favorite or regression move? uh you know it was always uh back in the day it was always 66 inside to down to, to 22 inside now multiply that times five yeah. you know it'd be like 330 down to to 110 you know because table limits what they are these right, days right uh, you wrote an article the other day about why johnny doesn't win why Johnny can't win. Can't win. That's it. Johnny can't win because he's willing to do the things you have to do to win or not to lose. That was a great article. It uh, is one I wrote back 15 years ago originally, and I've lost the original article, so I did my best to recreate it. Yeah, that was a great article. Uh, went through the, I went through the archives on the original Axis Power Craps forum, and there are over 70,000 posts there. And I was able to find some reaction comments to the original article where people had had posted questions and had reactions to the original article and was able to recreate the article as best I could based on those reactions. And so I, that's I admit that, you know, some of those some of those paragraphs hit me between the eyes because Oh, they hit all of us. I mean, you know, I, <laughs> I Nope. Everybody regression, needs regression is just not in my blood. And I can't not in mine like it used to be, you know? And and honest to God, John Patrick going full circle here would not recognize me today from the player I was twenty years ago. Right. And even twenty years ago, he thought I was a maniac. <laughs> you know, I mean he thought I was Yeah. Yeah, because people John, accused... John said in that seminar we did in Atlantic City. He stood in front of the group and said, I'm not a gambler. Heavy as a gambler. He said, I'll never bet. I would never bet 110 inside on a craps table and then regress to 22 inside. That's gambling. He said, I would never do that. You know, even regressing, I would never do that. I would never put $110 on a craps table. Well, I remember one time I was having a conversation with Aloha Johnny and I, I made the statement that Heavy is one of the best gamblers that I that I that you're ever going to run into. And he went, "No, you're hundred percent wrong. Heavy is not a gambler. He heavy is a great better." 
and I think he was accurate in that. I consider myself a player because I play the game, and I play it from both sides, up and down, long and short. Uh, when I'm not playing it live in the casino, I'm playing it here at the house. I play it with uh, wind craps online, a simulator, running yeah. betting strategies. I play it on the dice table here at the house. I give craps lessons here at the house. I got a guy in here, got a guy in here just recently that he had a he had what looked like a solid betting strategy, uh, substantial, substantially large bankroll right start out with six thousand action on the table Woo. i suggested to him that i could start with half that action we play a session head to head uh 30 rows something like that and i would have more money in my rack at the end of that session than he would and i we did that and i beat him by two thousand dollars now, I don't. I don't doubt that one bit. I've seen you bet. I have seen you bet. I have seen you win. He was, I mean, we, and we've all lost. You know, he was. He was a come better. I'll tell you that. Okay, that says and, a lot. Uh, what do you think about I me? Mean, you know, when I walk up to a table, and I think I think Nate rubbed off on me a little bit. Six and eight, you got a point. Whatever the point is. Field bet, combat, that might be a little bit of a banker dude in there too. Oh, yeah. But that's a little bit of my first play. I just want to see. It's a semi heat seeker kind of a play just yeah. to find out, you know, and if you're lucky enough to hit a nine, hit, hit a four nine or a 10 with that combat, then the field bet goes to odds and are you going to leave it flat yeah. and right? No, I, don't, I have no problem with that at all. I've used it myself. So not a uh, bad play. Yeah. You know, I, I like it early on when you're just trying to fill out your toss and yep. see where, see if your landing's on or your dice are acting the way you want them to act, that kind of thing. I, uh, be honest with you. I just soon skip all that all toss small stuff, skip all that come out bullshit. And, uh, Let's just get a dice game. Let's just bet some numbers. Yeah, I mean, you know, I learned I learned that game within a game from you guys, you and, and the other guys. and We I, have I a like... ball with it, you know? It's a lot of fun, but – and we make money at it. But it's mostly an entertainment bet. Yeah, that's really you – know? people don't get it. I mean, it, if you're on an ATS table, yeah, you know, it helps. Go ahead and knock one. Maybe if you're lucky, two of them out before yeah. you really, you know, you're really going. But, you know, the funny thing happened to me one time at, at, on that world bet that, that, that you taught me. Um, I was playing it on myself. I was shooting the dice. I had the world bet going, and it was a crapless table. And so when I do the world bet on a crapless table, I don't place the extremes because I got the world bet working. If I if I right. make the point, I will put odds on the point. And I can't I cannot resist putting those odds on a crapless table. So if it's an oh, eleven yeah. or a twelve, you know it's getting odds. I can't That's help. That's But I got the world bet going, so I don't have to place the two, three, and eleven because the twelve's the point, and I got the world bet. I got a, you know, and I may have an extra kicker on the ace deuce. I press up the world on the first hit, and I think I short. I think I. I think I might have hit another world number, and then then I was out. I sevened out, and I totally flipping forgot that that world bet stayed up to the next shooter. Totally <laughs> flipping forgot about it. I mean, I'm like, damn it! I, you know, I'm, I'm mad at myself for sevening out yeah. on, on a short row. Next guy comes out and throws aces and says aces is the point. <laughs> and I got $30 or something sitting on that world. Bet. That. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, you're paying me? I forgot. They, I pressed it. Son of a gun, if he didn't buckshot back to back those aces <laughs> on that world bet wow. that I had forgot I even had working anymore. 
So you never know. But uh, lightning strikes again. Yeah, it was a, one of those lightning strikes. But I love it. Your had, your uh, acumen at the table, and, ha- and and I've seen you do this. You, and as Nate said, and I've seen you do it for me and others. You will throw yourself under the bus to protect the guys that are in your crew. I uh, have been known to attract a little attention to uh, keep attention away from the guys in the classes and stuff. Well, uh, you know, you and I and a couple of, of our of the other guys were on Bally's table at, back when it was still Bally's. And I was having a good weekend. I mean, or a good several days. I was I was dialed in all weekend. I felt like pretty darn good. And I was trying I was trying my best cuz where I play there's no there's no fire bet and I'm really all, all I'm not even thinking about the ATS. I'm thinking yeah. about trying to hit fire bets all weekend. Never could get that six one. But we were at Bally's and I've already knocked off two points and the four is now the point. And I've you know, I've thrown six, eight times. I mean it hadn't been long. But yeah. the pit boss came over the top of the table behind the box man and said you can no longer set the dice and <laughs> i didn't want and to what argue did i with say do what? <laughs> do what and what did i say <laughs> oh you went off on him i mean you started going off on let me see the rule book i want to yeah, bring it bring let the book me see that down. in your let me see that in your in your uh, player manual. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you were going off on him. And I was trying to act stupid. Like, I'm sorry I didn't hear you because I wanted to make sure all y'all knew that there was a problem. And and then, and then I wanted my bets brought. I said, turn my bring my bets back. And the dealer wanted to just turn me off. And I said, no, don't turn me off. I want my chips back. Take me down. I mean, I was making all the scene I could just so y'all all would know that nah, this is all messed up. And if you remember, I turned around and faced left and threw the dice over my shoulder and I hit the point. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> threw a hard four. Go forward your point. You threw a hard four <laughs> backwards over your shoulder. <laughs> and and Hani, or whatever his name was, yeah. I won't spell his name, H-A-H-N-E, or whatever the hell it was. I don't remember if that's what it was. But, I think uh, close. <laughs> that's close. He about crapped his pants when that happened. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, you can't make up rules as you go along in the casino. I'm sorry. And just because you want to come down and, and insert yourself in the game and say, I'm sorry, Bally's does not allow dice setting in the casino. Since when? Yeah. You've been allowing it all weekend. You've been allowing it for the last 10 years. Who's in charge here? I'd like to speak to the casino floor manager. Let's right. get the shift manager down here. Can you show me a copy of the dealer operation guide that shows that in writing? Is it a recent letter? Show me a copy of the letter. Let's get the gaming commission on the freaking phone. I'd like to talk to them about this decision. Yeah, I mean, come on, dude. You can't change a game while the game's in progress. It's just not legal, you know. Yeah. That's bullshit. Yeah, they can change rules, but they gotta they gotta be consistent and be consistent in enforcing it. Talk to your guy in the other pit across the aisle over there. We were just playing over the air all morning and he hadn't said squat about it. No. Let's they... walk down to Paris. They don't say anything about it. In fact, they make fun of you guys down here because you guys hassle us. Isn't that funny? You know. Yeah. Uh no, I, in, a, in a case like that, I don't tolerate it. I just jump into them with both feet. What are they going to do? Throw me out of the hotel? <laughs> I don't care. I go yeah. across the street to MGM. Hell, I'm gold over there. So, yeah. Yeah. not a problem. <laughs> it's going to cost some business down the long run. But I've seen you do a lot of things to distract crazy people at a table. Uh, I've seen you try to run people off. I mean, you'll, you'll light up one of them cigars. You, you, you'll pick the cheapest cigar you got and light that thing up. If there's no better you to... blocker. 
at yeah. the end of a table, if you've got people trying to buy in at the end of the table and get the landing zone screwed up and to pull out a cheap cigar and fire it up, yeah. and they'll uh, they'll decide to move to another table right away. So, yeah, I know. I've seen yeah, I have time. used a cigar as a defensive mover maneuver before, and people wonder. Why do you smoke cigars at the craps table, Heavy? Well, there's a definite reason for it. It's called elbow room. Uh, yeah. If you've ever been crowded at the table, uh, I don't have that problem at casinos that allow you to smoke cigars in them. That, uh, that, reminds, of room. that reminds me of another story. When y'all used to do a lot of dark side play and you do a lot of dark side uh, seminars, are you doing, yeah. are, uh, I don't know, it's probably, my, my guess is it was around Halloween or something. But anyway, yeah, yeah. y'all would go down to a table and y'all couldn't all get on the table. So y'all would, whoever could get on there would start throwing a point and then try to shoot for the sevens. Yeah. yeah. And then all y'all would get on there and bet the don't pass. T- talk to me about that kind of a, yeah, that's, that that's was, an unusual uh, group that, and an that, unusual trip. That concept was actually uh, my late buddy Roadrunner's uh, idea, and George was uh, was really good at throwing sevens on demand. So uh, we'd go to the casino and and just put a pass line bet, nothing else out there, and set a point and throw a seven. Or we'd put a double pass bet out there, throw a point, throw a seven, seven out. Yeah. And... It didn't take but two or three of us doing that, or happened two or three times. And table, those people start to scatter, you know. They yeah. just couldn't stand to be around you. And yeah. next thing you know, we've got the table to ourselves because you've always got your guys lurking back in the background waiting to buy in as soon as somebody vacates a spot. So those were fun times. That was yeah, back in I the mean, early it, Yeah, I early mean, there's 2000s. two ways to look at that. I mean, a lot of a lot of people will sit there and go, y'all were deliberately trying to bust people out of the table. And yeah, yeah you're trying yeah. to bust people out of the table. Yeah. Uh, and the other point is, is, you know, you're controlling, you're controlling the dice or you're influencing the dice and you're trying to get your group on a table. And so, I mean, I think it's kind of hilarious myself that, you know, you can walk well, up. You got four or five guys your... that'll yeah. that'll just PSO, 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 and everybody's leaving. And then all of a sudden y'all come in and then everybody's shooting points. Yeah, I mean it's it, you're just trying to get into an optimal playing condition. And, yeah. and you know. And that didn't always work. I mean, you know, you get all your guys in there and suddenly, you know, no, I mean, you're there on a dark side weekend, and you get all your guys in there, and nobody can seven out. I mean, we had that happen at uh, oh, name of the casino. I can see it. In uh, hell, I'll think of it in a minute. Anyway, uh, over on the west side of Vegas. Anyway, we were playing out there one night. Group of us on a dark side weekend. Nobody could seven out. Nobody. <laughs> and then one guy down there, and, and our agreement was we're all going to shoot from the dome. And then one guy just decided arbitrarily, well, I'm just going to shoot from the right side. I can't seven out. So he flipped over and started shooting from the right side without telling anybody. And we're all still betting the dumps against him, but he's just having this damn hand that goes on forever. I finally figured out what he was doing. And I'm like, Look, that's it. Session's over. And I left, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, you guys are not going to follow the rules and not tell each other what you're doing. I'm out of here, you know. So I uh, I left and went and played slots the rest of the night. Hell with them. <clears throat> well, but yeah, go those ahead. kind of things happen too. Uh, I think you That's said like we, one uh, those, at one of those times you said that when all y'all were sitting on the don't, I mean, there's like, I don't know, let's just say eight of you on a table, might have been 10 or 12. Yeah. And every one of you bet the don't pass to come out. And the dealer says, I have never seen this before. Yeah, that was that night. That was (laughs) Grand Park Casino. That's where it was. Grand Park. We all walked up. We all played the don'ts. The dealer looked around and said, I've never seen this in my life. (laughs) (laughs) And then it was. There's so many ways to play craps and there's so many ways to win. But it's so much fun winning on 
the right side or the light side or the pass line side. So, I mean, cause yeah, and blackjack, all you get somebody sitting next to you bitching about the way you played your cards, Yeah, you know, and about three times of that, and I'm ready to smack the guy. So it's like, I best not be playing cards. Well, I'm not a guy. I know very, very basic stuff on cards. So, and I don't, I only do it if I need to I go just sit down and rest my leg. Low tolerance for playing right. cards in tight spaces with people. Are there I mean, any I others? go play cards. I'd love to play a $25 game before I play a, a 5 or $10 game just to get a table with a little elbow room. Well, you know, you wrote one of your articles the other day or a while back that about the inflation of the game, people still looking for $5 games and still looking for $10 games. Yep. And we're all guilty of looking we want to play a low a low minimum bet game sometimes. I agree. We all want to do that. We may sometimes we just need to do that. But you know, personally, I'd rather win on a twenty five dollar table than lose on a ten dollar exactly. table. Because you got all these other knuckleheads out there, and you can't you can't get your guys on a low minimum table because it's packed. Nope. It's packed for a reason. And so I think the more astute players are better off playing a slightly better limit or higher limit, even up to 25. I, mean, we got, I got yep. used to playing 25s during COVID until it didn't bother me no more. Right. But I, my, my favorite is a $15 table because yep. I can go 15 and up. I can do, I can do, I can play it as a 30 or whatever I want to. I, mean, I can do that on a 10, but I don't want to do that on a $10 table because all the knuckleheads are there. So, you know, I agree with you on that. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Great. Is there any any other story? I got one more thing I want to bring up before we close out, but is there any other story, you know, that just rings out that we hadn't talked about? I mean, I know, oh, I know what I want to ask you before we ask you that. Shoot. In your caricature, there's four guys, and I know three of them. I know there's you. I know there's Bo Parker, and I know there's South Shore Swami, but there's a guy with the gray hair with a drink in his hand, and I kind of like him because he's got a drink in his hand. Who is he? That's Roadrunner. That's Roadrunner. Okay. I, That's I Road wasn't Runner. sure who that was. I, yeah. yeah. I got to remember. That's George, George Pulley. George okay. is the guy who, if you have a checking account, and you can go online and pull up a photocopy of a, of a check that you wrote on your checking account and look at it, and everybody that has a checking account has that. George is a guy that originally wrote the software for that back 25 years ago and uh, his own company. And he sold that software to a, a major bank uh, software and check handling equipment company and, and made a whole lot of money off of it and retired young and Bought his and her hot air balloons for him and his wife in Albuquerque and lived in a nice old hacienda on the Rio Grande River and had a uh, little acreage out there with uh, room for the daughter's polo ponies. And <laughs> he had everything a guy could want. And, yeah. and then he bought a, 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 a world's most expensive tract home in Las Vegas, meaning he bought the lot and and the shell of the home, but he had everything inside the home done custom and he had everything, uh, outside the landscaping and everything done custom and all the fencing done custom, the wrought iron work done custom. He had the casita that was supposed to be a little extra garage to park a boat or something in. He had that made into his dice studio Had his little pool out back. We had many steaks and barbecue out the side and smoke cigars at generally enjoyed the good life in Vegas at his place. He let us do craps lessons at his house out there. He'd shuffle me around Vegas when I didn't have a car rental. Uh, sometimes he'd, he'd loan me, uh, he had an extra car in Vegas. He'd loan me the, uh, uh, GMC SUV. Let me drive that while he drove his. Now here's a guy worth, who knows, $15 million, and he drove a PT Cruiser. I'm like, George, why don't you have a Maserati? 
I like my PT cruiser. Okay. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> but uh, George was a great guy. I mean, he was a little obsessive compulsive. He had little problems with PTS or OT, OCD, you know, uh, and uh, had a little, little depression problems, you know, but uh, couldn't ask for a nicer guy. And uh, we had some great times together. Well, I he know knew. Sa- I know South Shore he, he and Kwame. Go ahead. Yeah, George had over 40,000 of his own personal in casino craps rolls written down in little spiral notebooks he carried around his pocket. So he carried those around at the table with him, and every roll, every toss, he wrote down the results. Right, toss, toss, write them down. And he had so much backspin on his dice, you could hear him cutting through the air when they went by. Hmm. I mean, incredible backspin. I don't know how he kept from just carving trails in the layouts as much backspin as he put on. But on his wall in his dice studio, he just had rack after rack of... uh, uh, 50 number rolls from the Fremont, you know, 29 right. number rolls, 40 number rolls, you know, hats and jackets and all that stuff. So he was a real deal. I mean, he could toss some monster rolls. So that's George. That's George. And then there's South Shore Swami, who's living he's up in lineman. the mountains now. Yeah. He's a guy that would hang from the, from the cable dangling from the helicopter's flying through the mountains, doing surveys on electrical lines because he was a lineman that got out of the helicopter, set down to straddle those high voltage power lines up in the Sierra Madres and scooch from one tower to the next inspecting the lines to make sure that they're all the insulation was good on them and everything. You're, you're bringing other people all of a sudden to my mind real quick before I get to my closing one. How about Dead Cat? Dead Cat. Philippe Salazar. Dead Cat was a good guy. Came to Vegas back in the mid-2000s. Uh, came in, flat-ass broke, busted, looking for a way to get into Vegas. Uh, he came to one of our early crap shoot, uh, craps fest events. Uh, somebody loaned him a comp for a room and let him stay in their comp, you know, an extra room comp for the weekend. And uh, wasn't long after that, he moved out to Vegas. And uh, Philippe was a good guy. He he tried hard. He had struggles with some issues, some personal issues. uh, But he tried to do well. He uh, ended up working for Stanford Wong as one of his bet runners, you know, he would, he would pick up, I probably shouldn't talk about this, but he would pick up $150,000 and jump on a Southwest flight up to Reno and take it up there and bet it in the casinos up there. Right. And sports books up there for, yeah, for their gambling group and do kinda, things like that. Kind of balance out the bets around the, around the. Yeah. 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 So it didn't look like somebody was, dumping a bunch of money at one market. And uh, they had a bunch of guys doing that, you know, it wasn't just him, but he was he was one of their runners. And he played a lot. And he also uh, worked with Charlie Westcott, who was Charlie, Charlie 007. Yeah, and Charlie uh, got hooked up with Mad Professor after... Uh, Iris Setter sold his forum to Debbie Gonzalez. He sold DiceHunter.com to Debbie. And Mad Professor started, he was still posting a lot of stuff in my group, but he started posting with uh, Charlie Westcott's forum, which was, uh, I think it was branded as the Mad Professor's forum or something or other. I don't remember exactly how they worked that out. But they made uh, Philippe the administrator of that forum. Okay. So he was the administrator of that forum uh, and did a good job of that as well. So uh, 
then he, uh, his mother passed away and he inherited some money from that. He and his sister, they sold all the property and, and uh, I think last I heard he had moved to South Dakota or somewhere and then he passed away a couple of years ago. Okay. So he is no longer with us. All right, so another one, and this is this this show that that we're doing is going to air after the person I'm going to bring up. Okay. And I didn't really know the guy. I had heard about it and I heard a story, and so I made me dig into it. And so I ended up getting some pictures from Memo, and of course, like I say, all this is already going to air before this one ever gets out again. I think probably, but gargoyle. Gargoyle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's my buddy Gargoyle, and he is uh, he is one of a kind. Uh, he's a great guy. He and I hooked up. Uh, it's been at least ten years ago, ten twelve years ago. Uh, I won't identify him by his real name. No, because I'll I'll talk about some some things here about when I first met him. Uh, Big craps player when I first met him. He was losing around a hundred thousand a year. Yeah. And basically came to me and said, I you know, I basically need help. I love the game, love to play. Need some help. You know, I gotta turn it around. You All know. Right. So I said, well, let's come in, let's talk, let's look at your bedding, let's look at how your toss is and all that stuff. And and so so we did a class together, we met, we talked, talked about his bedding, which was insane, you know. Yeah, uh, I bedding, can imagine. Bedding way too much, way too early. Didn't know what a regression was. You know, it was press, 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 press seven. You know, never yeah. take any money off the table. Right. And, and basically I said, okay, you got to, you got to slow everything down. You know, you got to bet a lot less than your betting, you know, yeah. like 10% of your bankroll is the most you can have on the table. And then you got to take two, maybe three hits. And then you got to reduce that bet size by at least half, you know, Yeah. and then take a couple of more hits. And then press up from there, but don't go full press, do half press or up a unit or, you know, slow press it first, you know, and get it up. Then take another regression. Yeah. After you take that second regression, then if you want to go balls against the wall and press more aggressively, then do it, you know, but get your bets paid for and get some money off the table, get a profit and then press and We'll work on the rest from there. Well, in the first year, we had, I don't know, I don't recall the amount, but it was a significant turnaround. It was like, right, you know, $75,000, $80,000 turnaround. So, I mean, I mean, he went from a negative 90000 to a positive sixty-five, seventy thousand. 70000 So, I mean... Right. Right. It was a significant turnaround just by, okay, take a deep breath and let's do this to your betting strategy and let's work on your toss a little bit like this and slow down and relax and take a deep breath and be cool, you know. Yeah. So, and it worked, you know. And we've been friends ever since. Uh, now, uh, Gargoyle is a very intense person. Yep. He is uh, an immigrant. All right. Okay. From the Middle East. Yep. Raised in a culture different from ours. Yep. I suspect from a very, I'm guessing, Gargoyle, I don't know, but I'm guessing, come from a family with a a fairly dominant father figure right? who probably raised him in the same tradition to be a pretty dominant kind of guy and be pretty aggressive. So that's kind of where he got his betting style and 
in all this. His personality style is pretty much the same. He is an IT professional. Yep. Very high in, very high level stuff. Earned a tremendous salary when he works and commands a lot of respect in the industry. And he's the kind of guy that when he speaks, shit gets done, you right. know? Right. So you understand the personality style we're dealing with here. This would be, he would have what I would call a type A personality. I'm a type A personality too, you know? I mean, I'm a guy that, I'm a big idea man. I come up with ideas. I say, we're going to do this, 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 and let's go do it, you know? Yeah. And if it doesn't get done, I get annoyed, you know? Yeah. And we figure it out from there because I've also got some of this type C stuff going on down here that muddles me up sometimes, but I'm a guy that likes to get things started anyway. And, and I'd like to see them get finished. Uh, but I'm definitely pretty hardcore type A going on and, and, and gargoyle is too. So playing in a group with gargoyle can be difficult. Okay. Because he can take things over if you allow him to. And when I'm playing with a group of guys in a classroom situation, I can't let that happen. So, you know, I, I have to be cautious when playing in a group of guys with another extremely strong personality type that will try and take over like that. In classes, and let me hearken back to one of our best friends from recent years, Dave, the cleaner. Yeah. Okay. Dave type a personality. Yeah. Dave, an achiever, Dave, go out, start a business, make a million bucks. Hey, this is great. We're going to do this now, make another million bucks, you know? And at the classes I did with Dave, Dave was always at whichever table Dave was at. We'd have three tables going. And I'd be coaching on one table. Howard would be coaching on one. Maybe Nate would be coaching on one or, or Mark would be coaching on one or somebody coaching on the table. And and there's Dave coaching right along with him. You got to do this. You got to do that. You know. And yeah. so I had to come up with the shut the fuck up Dave line which was <laughs> how about, how about cowboys? them cowboys right <laughs> so it became an institute in the class every class now i have to as part of my opening remarks say now boys and girls if at any time i find somebody is conducting their own meeting at the table as opposed to conducting our meeting at the table you may hear me shout out how about them cowboys? Yeah. Now, I'm not asking what the score is at the football game if you hear me say that. I'm asking you to cool it off and calm down a little bit because we're running a class here and it's not the class that you're the coach of. Yeah, I mean, and sometimes you have to do that. And yeah. and Bobby gets excited and gets – you're going to have to edit that. And Gargo gets excited and wants to coach the class and can sometimes get a little aggressive. Yeah. It is what it is. You know, I mean, it's human nature and some people have it uh, more so than others. And I understand that. And uh, uh, well, it is I what found, it is. I, yeah, I don't really know. I didn't really know him until I interviewed him. I had only met him one time. Yeah. And it was total coincidence in Biloxi. And he threw a hand. I didn't even know who he was. Yeah. 
Uh, and he, in fact, he was standing next to the next to Kelly, who built my table. You know Kelly. Yeah. And I'm on the other end, and Garville's got to catch a plane, and he comes by and introduces himself. You know, after and he's he's got to leave because you know you know you know Biloxi Airport. They, they, it's always oh, yeah. on time because <laughs> it's so small. But yeah, you know, I'm that's the only time I'd ever met it. Now I have interviewed. Him. And I found it to be one of the more enlightening and intriguing interviews that I've done up to this point. Just and maybe it's because I didn't know the guy, but it, it'll be coming up. Well, you know, with, during the month of July or early August, and I think you'll like it because he talked about how he used to be so aggressive and and forthcoming it or whatever, you know, on edge. But believe it or not, and I believe him when he says that he's kind of, that he's really mellowed out a lot now about only worrying about the things that he can control at the table, which is himself. But there was that story, and of course this is already run by the time this is going to come out, but there was this story about him and Memo being at Cromwell. Memo taking pictures of this guy humping on Nami. Is Nami? <laughs> I see you laughing. I heard the story. Yeah. And and it's hilarious. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know of a funnier story out there. I hadn't heard it yet, but it's it's hilarious. And I dropped those I dropped those pictures in on him in that in that in that interview, and it was it's so funny. I mean, it really is. If if anybody's watching this and they hadn't seen the gargoyle interview, go back and watch the gargoyle interview because it's it's hilarious. I mean, because uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed interviewing him a lot. Well, uh, he and I talk on the phone pretty regularly. I mean, yeah. he calls me or I call him. You know, once every every couple of months, just to check in. Uh, and we've talked about getting together and playing, but his his work schedule has been such that he just hasn't been able to take off and play, right. unless he just happens to be flying through a casino town on the way to do a job somewhere. He hasn't been able to play at all. Yeah. But I think that's changed recently. I think he's. Uh, yeah. Not. Uh, so no, yeah. uh, I think he may be able to get loose and play a little. I'm hoping so, because I'd like to see the guy again and uh, and get to the tables with him. So, yeah, he and I have talked about trying to get together on a couple of runs down in Mississippi. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned cleaner, uh, you know, and that's where I was going to go before I got into your closing remarks. But because we've been on quite a while, this is end up good. Boys and girls, this is going to be a two-parter. There's no way about it. Uh, it's going to be a heavy part two and heavy part three, and who knows, it may end up being a part four someday. But um, I can't close out with you without talking a little bit more about the cleaner because the cleaner was an average guy if you just saw him. He did have that boisterous personality, but there was not a kinder man out there and there was not a I, I'm gonna say a gentleman you know I mean he had his he had his northern northern raising and and so forth but he lived down in South Florida but he was a true gentleman yep and and he left this world last February I was actually at a casino when I got the word and you know his saying was Today's the day. Today is the day. And so we would walk around the casino all that weekend and that time saying today's the day. Yeah. The man was, was, he loved to cruise. He loved craps. I mean, he absolutely loved to play this game. And I know you and he were close. Yep. And, you know, I think about him not every day, I admit that, but I think about him quite often, and I think about him when I go into Biloxi, 
and just how much fun he was to be around and be on a table with. And so I yep. miss I miss the cleaner. I, every time I scroll through the pictures on my phone, I stumble across one of one of him and me, uh, or him alone, or him and my daughter on a cruise ship, on a cruise excursion in the casino, one place or another. Yeah. And, uh, and we had so many great times together. And the guy would do anything in the world for you. I mean, it's just crazy. He would do anything for anybody that, that he was friends with. There's no doubt about it. And probably for yeah. a stranger, but if he could. Yeah. But, I mean, he would really oh, – he was amazing. Now, he was also hilarious. Um, I mean, I can tell a couple of stories about him. You could probably tell some. But a couple of my favorites was in Biloxi. One time we were at the Beau Rivage, and I was at Stick Left One. And he's always trying to – you know, he wanted to be at Stick Left One. I wanted to be at Stick Left One. And I say, well, Dave, I'll just back up, and you slide down. And we've got our spots. And we were playing, and then I'd come in, you know, he'd, he'd toss, and then I'd come in and bet. I'd back up, and then he'd toss. I'd come in, and I got to noticing my rack wasn't growing. <laughs> and I was like, Dave, cleaner, you're betting out of my rack. Your chips are over there. My chips are right here. Quit betting out of my rack. <laughs> You know, <laughs> had that issue before, not with yeah, him, I mean, with another he, guy. He, he would get so he would get so in, you know, focused. I guess on what he was yeah. doing, he slide down. There's chips. I'm gonna bet these chips. You know, and 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 I was like, Dave, you just gotta quit betting out of my rack. <laughs> yeah, he would. Uh, he would struggle with those betting progressions. Every class, and oh, he yeah. must have done well, eight classes with me. I don't know, at least eight. He'd have to give me a side. Now, heavy now, now, write those, write those progressions down for me one more time. Dave, you got a book there? Opened up to the back. Now, thumb forward about five pages. There they are, right there. They're in the yeah. book. Yeah, but write them down for me, cause I, you know, I can't ever find anything in these books, and, <laughs> and it's just like you got to write them down. Okay, four and ten, fifteen, twenty-five, fifty, a hundred, two fifty, five hundred, a thousand. Yeah, <laughs> you've got to go through every one of them and write it down for them every class all over again. Yeah, you he just was, couldn't remember. Them. He would call me. Every so he, he liked to watch my channel. He would call me, Where'd you get that? Where'd you get that set from? I'd be like, You know where I got that set from. I use Bone Tracker just like you do. Yeah, yeah but I can't throw it with that set. I've been, I've thrown 5,000 tosses with that set and I can't do what you're doing with it. And I said, We don't toss the same way, cleaner. Toss is different. That's it. <laughs> In fact, I'm going to take something off the wall here. Yep. Uh, I've got it hanging on my wall. So <clears throat> I guess I guess I guess this is my, my tribute to the cleaner because I'm gonna have to put my glasses on to read it. But uh, he wrote down one of my rolls one time. And uh, he said uh, he he uh, you, can you see that? I mean, yeah, it's a picture of me and my hat down there in the corner. But you see, right there. I mean, yeah, there he is. I mean, he's got a he's got a darn an envelope, right? He took an envelope. Yeah, yeah. Because right there, right there is the postal mark. That's the typical cleaner. But he wrote down every roll I rolled, and although all that whole the whole thing. Is nothing but my rolls, and I think it it was sixty. He's got it marked. It was sixty-two rolls. Oh, yeah. 
And down here at the bottom, he, and he, this is the frame he sent it in. He said, Ed, I just witnessed a great role. Signed, The Cleaner. So that's my tribute to him. That's the kind of guy he is. I mean, that just showed up at my office one day uh, from, from, from The Cleaner. So, I mean, he's, he, he's that, he was just that kind of a nice of a guy. All right, so I know we've been on the air a long time. And right now it's, it's mid-July. you got a lot of things coming up. This is probably not going to air. Probably it could be August or early September. But you got a lot coming up. So give me, give me real quick what your schedule is, maybe out through November, December, whatever. Yeah, September. Let's talk about September 1st. Uh, have a uh, Access Power Craps seminar and my big birthday bash coming up in Las Vegas, September the 8th through the 11th. Uh, I turned 74, actually on September 6th, but I'm not going out there Labor Day weekend, so we'll go out the weekend no, after. I wouldn't do that either. And uh, we're going to do a little class out there. I am uh, not sure if I'm going to need or have an assistant coach at this point. Uh, due to Nate's schedule, he's uh, in the air, uh, and uh, not sure if he's going to be able to attend. And... Uh, so it's going to depend on how many people we have signed up. Uh, right now we've got, I think, four. So yeah. we're plugging along. It's early yet. Usually we get most of our sign-ups in the last 30 days. So Right, right. Uh, we'll see. I'd like to wind up with a dozen or so. Be a nice size class. If we get a dozen, I'll be uh, bringing in a second person to help out. If we wind up with a half a dozen, it's just going to be old me and you guys, and we'll have a great time. Yeah. Uh, we won't have trouble finding a table to play on if there's just a half a dozen of us. We'll get out there and play and have a good time and have lots of one-on-one -on -one time at the dealer school. If uh, that, That's it. That's that weekend. Uh, if we live long enough to make it to that time next year, it's going to be heavy's diamond jubilee. I'll be 75. I'm going to All be right. like the queen. I'm going to get my diadem. Wait a minute. Let me get my diadem. That's my uh, diadem there. And uh, <laughs> that's my dia stick. I'm sorry. And uh, we'll uh, have a parade down uh, Las Vegas Boulevard or something. No, we'll, we're going to have a big blowout for uh, that next year, 2000. Uh, I'd love to be 24. at that one. There's no doubt. I'm going to try love, to arrange that completely I would love different. to be at that one. Yeah, we're gonna, I'm going to try to do that in a little bit different manner. I'm going to reach way back and try and get as many of the old crowd from back in the day as I can. And instead of doing a full-blown seminar, I'm going to organize it around. Basically, uh, anybody wants to come in and get about an hour long. Have three people come in at a time and do toss tune-ups. You know, three people come in, have a 20-minute tune-up piece. You can watch the other people get their tune-up while, uh, you know, we're waiting your turn. You get 20 minutes with the coaches. And uh, then the rest of the weekend, you can go out and play craps with the rest of the guys. We'll try to set up a, uh, a, a hospitality suite somewhere where you can go decompress once in a while, if you need to, maybe uh, have an adult beverage or two around and some snacks and uh, kind of just have a good time. And hopefully, I don't know, we don't want more than 100 people at this thing. But... <laughs> That's a pretty good crowd. Uh, I'd be Might happy. Think with... over three or four casinos with that. Yeah, I'd be happy with 30 or 40 people, but uh, that'd be awesome. There's a lot of old guys out there I'd like to see again that have come to the classes through the years. I mean, we've we've trained probably, God, close to 400 people through the years. You know, you think about it. I mean, we get a lot of people over and over and over. So when you look at the repeat business we get, uh, we see a lot of the same faces, you know. But we get a lot of new faces, too, that people come in for a class, maybe two, and then we never see them again. So we'd like to see those people again, too, just to see what the hell they've been up to. Right. Now, uh, in November, we'll be back in Biloxi. Back in Biloxi in November, Veterans Day weekend. 
And that is going to be a fun time because Biloxi, whew, hurricane season should be behind us by then. Not too much of a threat of a big blow, but we'll be right in the heart of what? Oyster season. <laughs> get us some fresh oysters. Get us some boudin balls. Get us some cold beer. Man, can't be beat. We'll be down there chowing down on the good food. Uh, lots of hot sauce. Lots of romalade. Uh, a little you jambalaya some, won't hurt either. A little jambalaya won't hurt. A little, uh, little that uh, fireball stuff you drink or whatever the hell it is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> get you some of that. So that means we'll probably be hanging around the Hard Rock a lot. Probably and, so. Uh, yeah, probably <laughs> so. And uh, having a good time. So be thinking about uh, Veterans Day weekend in Biloxi, and we would love to see you come down for that. The rest of the time, I'm hanging around here at the house in East Texas. You guys have saw my picture on Facebook today, sitting on my fat ass on the front porch, smoking a cigar, bored to death, wishing somebody come out and take a private class. Uh, yeah, I know we're out of the way out here. We're in Hooterville, but come on out. We'll uh, feed you a bologna sandwich. If you're really hungry, we'll feed you a fried bologna sandwich. I was gonna ask you <laughs> if it was fried or not. That's right. <laughs> and uh, get you get you in here on the uh, the famous heavy perfect world craps table, the table that actually matches the back wall behind me. That's the, the craziest layout I've ever seen. I just layout be honest matches with everybody. Matches the back wall, boys and girls. And uh, if if they don't kind. if if they don't understand it. Your layout looks just exactly like that wall behind you with the craps. Yep. That's, that's yep. the felt. It's with just, the got a, uh, just got a, just got a, just got a, a layout with the box numbers and everything laid on top of the bricks. That's it. So that's what it looks like. And, uh, and if you don't think you can lose a pair of red and green dice on that brick layout, I guarantee you throw them down there once and they just vanish. It's like they got camouflage on, <laughs> but we have a lot of fun on it, and it's a good time for everybody. So, yeah, private lessons out here, and you can uh, email me anytime at axispowercraps at gmail.com, or you can text me on uh, on uh, Facebook, on Messenger, uh, through the private Axis Power Craps Facebook group, Yeah, which uh, you have to be a member of to uh, be able to view anything. Yeah. So all you got to do is just try heavy's to join now. Heavy's Axis Power Craps or something like that. Yeah. Right? And then you've got, you've, I, got I the work, don't, you've got the don't one as well, but yeah, not as many Heavy's people. Wrong Way Craps group. Yeah. And a word about those groups, uh, guys, you got to join with a, a legitimate Facebook page. If you have a Facebook J page that says Bob the Crap Shooter, I'm sorry. Bob the Crap Shooter is not a legitimate Facebook page. Bob Jones or Bob Smithfield or Bob Deadpeckerhead or whatever your name is, that's a... I mean, come on. I realize maybe you might not want your mama and them to know you're playing craps or whatever. On the other side of the coin, how many people out there do you know that have a Facebook account named... James Robertson. There are about 14 million of them. So I don't think your mom and them is going to figure it out. Right. So go ahead and start yourself up a Facebook page with your real name on there. Create yourself an avatar picture based on your face. that sort of looks like you and put your little picture on there and get yourself a few friends and all that stuff on your Facebook page. And then apply for a membership. Typically, we don't approve brand new Facebook accounts because that's the way the bad guys get in to steal our information off our pages. Typically, we don't approve Facebook pages that don't have a picture of the person who's trying to join the group because we like to know who we're looking at, you know? Yep. Hey, it's not a racial discrimination thing. It's not a, oh, we don't want a woman in the group thing. No, it's a, we want to make sure we're dealing with a real person 
And I know anybody can pick a picture out of a catalog and upload it and say, that's my picture. But we're just trying to nail down, thin down the potential for having somebody on here that's an identity theft person that's trying to gain access to our membership roles. You get people in these Facebook groups that join Facebook groups in order to copy the list of the members in that group. And if they can copy the list of all the members in that group that are interested in casino gambling, then suddenly you're getting junk mail from every gambling website in the world because yeah. they've stolen it from this Facebook group. And I do my best to try and protect people from that. You do so, a good job. You've got good moderators. That's why we, that's why we, we do our best to try and protect people from that because I've dealt with this stuff for over 20 years on the internet and and I've kind of learned a few lessons the hard way from that. So do my best to try and protect you guys from that. So uh, work with us on that. And, and we do I'm, have rules on the group. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right. and, and you will get the rules read to read, read to you when you join the group. So yeah, uh, just be prepared for them. Don't be a dickwad is number one. Number one rule: don't be a dickwad. That's it. <laughs> I'm fortunate. It's the golden enough, rule, as a matter. I'm of fact. fortunate enough to been in there for a long time, and I and, and you allow me to post videos in there, which is special. And I don't, I try not to take advantage of it because I only post ones I think that are really relevant to the group because I do a lot of stuff that's not relevant, but on, on my channel, but a lot of, some, when I find one that's relevant, I, I'll post it in there and I appreciate it. There are a lot of people that, that, uh, that would take advantage of that offer and, and you don't, which is why you get to do it. Yeah. And there are others that. I allow to do it that post more than they should. And yeah. Uh, yeah. who knows how long that offer will continue. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, you know, I'll probably edit this out, but you know, it, it's like not everything I do really fits in with, with the, uh, I don't know, the, the central theme of, of the group and of what you do. And so I don't post it in there because it don't fit. Yeah. You know, not everything I do fits in. <laughs> so, you know, but if I think it's relevant and it fits or it's entertaining and, and it fits in with some stuff that you teach, I throw it in there sometimes. But See, I don't now know that's, often. You, you said the magic word there, if it's entertaining. Yeah. You see, and that's, that's the thing I come back to. I mean, I come up with some, some pretty irreverent stuff sometimes. But if it's funny... And I have a warped sense of humor, I'll admit. But I do too. But if it's funny, it's a good chance I'm gonna throw it out there and see if somebody laughs, you know. Yeah. If they don't, I'll just go up and take it down. You know, I mean it's one click to to remove a post. It's not right. a problem. Right. You know. I don't want to offend the world. Well, uh, I'll I'll close this out with just, you know, just saying I, I, I appreciate you coming back and, and allowing us to redo or, or, or do part two. We had severe technical issues. I was really reserved on part one, but we got through it. We got through it. Uh, we've got no issues tonight that I can tell. And I appreciate you. I appreciate you coming in. Hey, I may, I may bring you back in because, you know, there may be something else that pops up and I go, I want to get heavy's perspective. I'm sure it. I've, I'm sure I've forgotten something, but who knows? Yeah. I mean, I'm going to get I, back with you with, Hey, I got some more stories. Yeah. So. I got, I got a, I got a message from Nate and I had to, I had to back out of our thing because of the wife's car trouble that she had but we we were going to he, he came back you know not not long after his came out and he was like oh i thought of all these other things and he sent me this long outline of stuff that he wanted that he had forgotten about so yeah i got to get him back on here but uh anything else you want to say before we close this out no my ass hurts <laughs>